And then there's like the 25 outstanding podcasts for readers. And we are we're not one of those 25, apparently, which is bullshit and wrong. And this whole list is garbage. Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad um, from Open Letter Books. I'm here with Tom Roberts from Riff Raff. And this week, we, we haven't podcasted in a couple weeks. Um, and our last one, I think, was not necessarily our best, <laughs> best moment. Um, or mostly, mostly not my best moment because I didn't do enough research ahead of time and managed to make a million errors in, in that podcast. I don't know if it was a million, but, you know. It was it was significant. Like there were and there were there are errors that are at least two of them that are really bad. So I think before we get into this one, um, make a few corrections. One was in the in the the name of that that uh, podcast, but the book, the Panthers Panthers in the Hole, the graphic novel that Phony Media is doing, which I've read. I don't think I finished it, but I read almost all of it um, a couple weeks ago, and it's it's really interesting. It's really good. It references. Angola in the jacket copy, it is not talking about the country. It is talking about a prison that is nicknamed Angola in the South, right. yeah, which makes a New Orleans, right? Yeah. Which makes a shitload more sense. Like, yes. <laughs> like, I don't know how that didn't quite. Well, I, I, yeah, I just looked at the jacket copy. It just says Angola never specified in the part that I looked at. So I was like, oh, OK, that, that's interesting. But OK, so that was wrong. We also referred Confused Sophie Hughes and Sophie Lewis. Sophie Hughes is the translator of Umami, which we talked about. Sophie Lewis is the former Delkey employee. Um, not not related, even though they have the same name. So first name. So totally not related. And then when we were talking about the Basque book, I said that Real Sociedad um, had Basque-only players. That is not true. They did, but they ended in 1989. However, Athletic Bilbao hasn't so there there's i was partially right i just had the two best teams confused as to which one decided they would only allow basque players to be on their team that's athletic bilbao but i don't know if they're i don't know where they are right now in the standings probably not great so that's it corrections <laughs> all right I, I bet there were more though but what those ones sure go. there were we do this you know don't like we have a team of research assistants or something or <laughs> <laughs> something like that yeah no and it's sort of all on the fly so forgive us forgive us if we go for way way wrong but but you said you so you wanted to talk about first of all about um neba well it used to be neba now it's any iba i don't know if you pronounce that differently no they still pronounce it neba okay so so neba which took place in providence this weekend right uh yeah and my understanding having never been to one of these before is that it's always in providence um, oh, it used part- to be in, it was in Boston before a couple times. Maybe a couple times. I get from what they told me that they do it in Providence a lot, uh, because it's the easiest way for people from New York, the publishers and whatever to come up. So, though not terribly convenient for the booksellers from, uh, you know, Burlington, Vermont, uh, for those who don't know, um, and why would you, quite honestly, unless you're a bookseller listening to this, NEVA is the New England Independent Booksellers Association. It's a sort of um, sub-organization to the American Booksellers Association. Um, I don't know exactly how they all work together, but they do seem to in some way. It's like the regional the regional part, so like... Yeah, like uh, ABA being like for national all booksellers. And then there's tons of these little, not tons, but I think there's like six or eight of the regional ones that are just the booksellers from that area so that they can do things together when they can't make it to the national conference. Yes, and they're scheduled. Um, almost everyone had theirs in the month of September. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, like you said, they're, they're regional. They're meant to, to complement, I would say. The Winter Institute, which we've talked about before, which takes place in January, and which the ABA puts on, and then the Book Expo, again, that ABA puts on, which is in uh, end of May. Uh, so the, these regional ones are done at this time of year to sort of um, you know, fill that gap and uh, address more local sort of issues. I had never been to one of these as a publisher. Oh, they're fun. They're yeah, I mean, they, it's definitely a very different experience than going to BEA, which is a nightmare. 
you know, those thousands and thousands of, of vendors on the exhibition hall floor over several days, um, most of whom at this point are probably not even people who make books, but things that you would sell in a bookstore, sidelines, all of that crap. Um, and the education portion of BEA, as you know, is, is so diffuse and hard to make sense of that, uh, I don't know how many booksellers actually go to those things because some, they of all, them are, some of them are really well attended. Some of them. Okay. But I know a lot of, they have their own ABA puts on uh, bookseller education as it's called uh, before the BA proper even starts, which is a good way of separating it. But of course adds time uh, spent in New York for the booksellers and that gets expensive very quickly. So, and not to mention they're like, you know, in the basement of some of the, of the Javits Center and that sort of thing. And, you know, people are just overwhelmed by the exhibition floor. And a lot of booksellers, honestly, if, you know, because it's New York, because all of the publishers are there, they can meet with publishers and they try to take their time to do that. Um, not always going to the education stuff. Winter, Winter Institute is great for education um, and for meeting people, you know, getting FaceTime with publishers. It's really uh, easy to do that there. Anyway, so I'd never been to a NEBA um, when I was at New Directions. New Directions doesn't go to the um, regional trade shows. Yeah. Uh, we it's not either. to say that it wouldn't be worth it. I don't know what the costs are to go as an um, exhibitor, basically. It's not that expensive. I th- I'll look it up as you talk, but uh, I don't think it's – when we used to, I used to go – for Delkey, we would go to two every year um, to meet new booksellers and to promote like Context Magazine to get it out into more stores and to um, be able to meet people that wouldn't otherwise come from the regions that were big for us. So like Neba or um, – what's the one? Northern California, NCIBA, and then the uh, Northwest, Pacific Northwest, which is uh, PNBA, I think it was. Yeah, that would make sense. And we'd rotate and go go to those. And I think it was it was reasonable. It wasn't expensive at that time. Now that I'm saying that, that was like fucking 15 years ago. I'm just old. So I don't know. It's probably a million dollars now. It can't be that bad. And I will say the interesting thing going now as a bookseller um, to this thing is the camaraderie the everyone knowing everyone else is on so much more display than it is at Winter Institute or, or BEA for sure. Um, at Winter Institute, you know, you're there with a couple hundred other booksellers, but you know, realistically, how many of them do I ever deal with, uh, you know, in the course of business or, or socially or any of that sort of thing, you know, you there are these sort of clicks among booksellers and it's, you know, as in any aspect of life. And so it's, it's rare to meet, too many new booksellers um each year you go to winter institute even as a publisher it's i mean that's the goal every year but you know it's harder to do because there are just so many it's kind of overwhelming um but sitting in the room you know going to the the education panels um which i do have one thing i want to relate when you sit there you know the people who are on the panel at the end of the panel they take you know questions from the audience they know everyone on a first name basis you know and that's it's pretty charming to know that on, on top of that, that a lot of these people have visited each other's stores. And so when they bring up a question or they talk about something, it's knowing the context from which they're asking that question or making a comment. And for me too, like, you know, we've only been living in new England for four months, but I've b- visited a lot of these stores. And so when somebody says something and can say, Oh, okay. I understand why she's saying it that way. And, you know, I get it now. Um, which is a lot harder to do at Winter Institute when, you know, some like if Steven Sparks gets up there and talks about what it's like working in the two green apple stores, somebody from the East Coast very likely has seen pictures of the store and that's it, right? Yeah. So, yes, he may have something important to say, but it's a lot, it becomes enhanced when you can actually visualize what he's talking about. And that's hard to do. And that's a big reason why I was doing what I was doing with New Directions and visiting the stores and, you know, spending two hours on the floor with the booksellers to sort of understand things. Um, And which brings me to the point that I think it does benefit publishers to go to these things because the people you meet at these smaller regional conferences tend to be the actual booksellers themselves in addition to the the owners of the store who, you know, more and more likely are, are not necessarily on the floor. Um, 
and it's valuable as publishers to get in touch with those people and meet them face to face so you can send them galleys directly so that you can create an open line of communication directly with booksellers um, as opposed to the owners. Like Mitch Kaplan is great, but everyone wants Mitch Kaplan's ear and he's not on the floor at his stores. In my opinion, right. It'd be much, it's much more useful as a publisher to get the galley in the hand of the person that is most interested in international literature. Exactly. Right? Yep. That's, That's the point of these regional shows is, is very valuable for as a publisher. Um, and for me, just watching and talking, like, look, there were a couple bookstore owners that I wanted to meet, just, you know, say hello and get their advice on that part of it. But then there was also booksellers I was happy to meet who are like on the floor and like talking about, you know, how to deal with customers how it is up here compared to New York or how it is compared to, you know, California and custom, you know, there are regional differences in, you know, just sort of way people behave in public and all of that sort of thing that, you know, I'm sure we'll pick up as we open the store, but there is, you know, it's always interesting to hear what people have to say about that kind of thing as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I, that's the part that I liked best was meeting people. Cause I like meeting the, the owners or the managers, but meeting the people who are, who are strictly just the booksellers that are able to go to these regional shows, but probably don't go to BEA or Winter Institute, um, was really always kind of gratifying. Cause they're, they're, right. it's, it's cheaper, obviously. I mean, everyone drove to Providence. Right. right. And when I, and I, when I worked at um, Quail Ridge, that was the one time, like I had never gone to a show before, but they had um, Seba, the Southeast one was in, was it in Greensboro? I think it was in Greensboro. And um, everyone from the store was allowed to go to it. So it drove over and was able to walk around. And it was kind of amazing to me at that time, being like a uh, second or third year bookseller, to be able to have publishers like courting and trying to give you books and, and meeting authors and all sorts of stuff. It was That was really fun for me at that point in time, especially. And it was cool that like everyone from the store could go. And I assume that that's the case with a lot of these. They're much more democratic in a way. Yeah, I mean, I met, you know seven or eight people who worked at Brookline Booksmith, who I had never met before. Um, but, you know, it's 45 minutes away. So they just, they all come down for a little while. And it's like, oh, you too work at Brookline. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that because it's regional, you don't get the national sort of uh, reps yeah. from various publishers. They're the actual, you know, reps from the region. And it's usually, I figured it probably does match pretty well um, region to regional reps. Um, and so these are people that, again, like these reps have only met the buyer for the store. They don't get to meet the frontline sellers. And so the booksellers come and they get to meet everyone. And, but it also, there's this weird sort of familiarity that's really, you know, interesting to watch unfold that, you know, these are the reps, but they stand there behind the exhibition table all day too. And, you know, they have the books on display. It's just a, it's a different way of doing it. Definitely. Yeah. The cost is actually much higher than I thought it would be sort of, um, for a table for, if you're a Neba member, the table is $525. Um, and that comes with two free badges. If you're not a member, it's seven twenty five, which seems high. But if you're a first time exhibitor, it's only three fifty. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a kind of uh, that's kind of cool. Like it's tempting to be like, okay, you know, we could go to all these once because we've never exhibited as open letter. Um, if they're if they're similar uh, at, at like the other locations too, we could hit a couple of these, and it wouldn't be that bad. I mean, that's less than the Brooklyn Book Fair Festival. I was just going to ask you, I was, uh, to me, that seems like a comparable thing. Yeah. Uh, the, the Brooklyn book festival, cause you can sell books there and, and to individuals sort of like has a different, um, different cost assessment that goes along with it. We didn't go this year. Did you, or you didn't go into, you would never have gone back to go see the Brooklyn book festival, right? Uh, no, I, <laughs> oh, no, I've done it standing behind the exhibition table both at a public space and for new directions uh, for one lifetime. I was thinking when uh, I forget who texted me, somebody texted me and like, are you going to the Brooklyn book festival? And I was like, you know, I don't live there anymore. And they're like, well, don't want you to come back for it. I was like, no, I always snuck out early to go watch football. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was doing during the, <laughs> during the Brooklyn book festival. <laughs> But um, so I had one thing I wanted to mention because it, it just I, I was seething sitting there in the audience for this. There was a, a, a panel on customer service training, basically, um, by a bunch of I think there were four or five 
for, let's say, managers slash owners of bookstores who were discussing uh, how to train your staff the right way and the easiest way. And, you know, whatever, everyone does this their own way. Um, and my experience has always been different at different stores, too. It's like, you know, some have like manuals, which is crazy to me. And then some, you know, just throw you into the fire, which is how I learned. And um, but they had, you know, these these points of emphasis that they kept making, you know, as examples, like how to answer the phone. And there was this whole discussion about how millennials are not really comfortable on the phone because they don't talk on the phone and <laughs> that sort of thing. It was really bizarre. Um, but at one point, this woman was talking about how, um, you know, when you're in the store, you can't, if you're behind the counter or whatever, you're talking to a fellow employee, you can't talk about your customers because, you know, everything is on display and you never know who's listening, et cetera, et cetera, unless the store is like dead empty. Like just, you know, make sure that you understand whatever you're saying is like basically out there for the world and don't say anything stupid. You know, if some, you have a troubling customer and they leave, don't go bad mouthing them because the next customer might know who that is or something. Anyway, this woman says, you know, and make sure, you know, not to say anything political and, you know, one way to combat any sort of political, um, you know, melee is the sort of, if you have a book that, you know, slams Donald Trump on the, at the cash register, make sure to have one about Hillary to make sure it's fair and balanced. And Whoa. I'm just seething there in the audience going, why would you, what? Like, we're not the public library. We're yeah. not obliged to have both sides of the issue, especially on something so, so transparently divisive. Like, why would you not? What if the, what if the entire existence of your store is based on standing for these things that you believe in and that come down to political issues sometimes? Like, why on earth? Like, no, that is insane. Of course, you should be able to have like a personality. Yeah. I, happily stand there and, and explain to a customer why I'm not carrying books by Donald Trump. Like, <laughs> like, it's like you're not the news. Not the news. <laughs> We're not the news. We're not the public library. We are not funded by anybody. We are not meant to be fair and impartial. That is that is not my role. My role is to offer something that I think, you know, uh, contributes to a conversation. And I'm going to choose the things that I think are on <laughs> the intelligent side of the conversation, you know? <laughs> It was, I was shocked. And everyone in the audience is like, yep. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, New England, like quiet, waspy diplomacy on display, you know? That's crazy. That is really crazy. Just on a uh, related note to the Donald Trump thing, you know that book, The Making of Donald Trump, the Melba House one? The yeah. guy who wrote that, David K. Johnson, is here, lives here in Rochester. And he's that book is a finalist for the um, Best of Rochester category of like Best Rochester Book. <laughs> Of the past year, which we won last year at the Tunisian book or the writer, book by the Tunisian author, uh, Rochester Knockings. But he's on there as like, but I think he's on there as best author too. So, okay. Donald Trump. Just, okay. just random connection. I just think it's funny because there's usually you don't think of these people ever being like here in Rochester. Right. Necessarily. Right. And then when they are, they get, they get to win all these prizes. <laughs> it's like strange competition. But anyways... Anything else with Neba that you wanted to add? Um, did anything else happen? I don't think so. Not so either. Uh, um, I saw some people that talked about going to it. Like Soho went, didn't they? Like Abby went. Abby went. Uh, Europa was there. Michael was here. Um, anyone else that I knew from New York? Otherwise, it was like you know the normal people you expect to see the the big houses and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I can't think of small presses. They had a list on on their website, but I, I closed that tab. I just have the other one of the costs on it. But yeah, usually. Fun. Anyway, it was a good time. I know a lot of our listeners are not booksellers and/or publishers, and will never be able to benefit from a, a, a regional trade show. But there you go. But still, you know, it's it's interesting. That's how the it's. it's I, I think even for those people, it's interesting to see like how the business works. That the books don't just magically appear in the stores or like. There is like a personal connection to all parts of this. Oh, yeah. And an example of that is uh, the keynote speaker, or not speaker, I guess she was just there being interviewed. She didn't like deliver a, a presentation or anything like that, was Zadie Smith. Really? Yep. Who <laughs> was there, I presume, for like six hours and then 
back to New York or wherever, you know, uh, she's being demanded to go. Uh, promoting her book that comes out in, um, I think, November or December. Oh, I was just going to ask if she had a new book coming out. Yeah. Are you a Called fan of hers? Yes, I am. I am. Um, I don't love them all. Like, every time, I'm not, like, dying to read them. Like, I didn't really like On Beauty. I didn't read that. The one that I, the only one I read was the one, the uh, Northwest, or NW. NW. I, I thought that was NW. okay. And I really liked Autograph Man. Oh, okay. Um... I think she's great, and she's very smart when you hear her uh, discussing her work and everything like that. Very diplomatically, you know, she has that British, you know, way of, of dissecting an issue and talking about it, which sounds very, you know, level-headed. But she still manages to say, like, exactly what she wants to say, and it's still, you know, provocative. You know? I like that um, when I looked up NW to try and remember the name of it, there's, like, on Google they have now, they box off a lot of, like, core information. Um, which I guess they're getting from Wikipedia or Goodreads. God knows where. Anyways, it says that NW it has like 3.4 out of 5 stars on Goodreads. It gives a little description. It says it was published in August 27, 2012. And genres are tragic comedy and experimental literature. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> experimental it is. But... That's what, yeah, that's that's the one that I need. Okay, I guess. Um, we used to have this sort of... Oh, no, I probably shouldn't talk about it. It's, it's kind of too random. But... um. There's a uh, Esther Allen thing related to Zadie Smith, where she always thought that it'd be cool to name a book Dating Zadie Smith because people would probably just buy it because they think that that sounds really cool and it didn't, wouldn't have to have anything to do with that <laughs> inside. Uh, a long running joke of Dating Zadie Smith, which I could use as the title for the book that I sent off the other day. So I'm considering it because I think it would be funny. It's not a bad title. It's like I was a bookseller when that book called winner of the national book award was published oh yeah yeah infuriating and yet genius at the same time yeah but, and dating zadie smith would fit for this book because it'd be like the idea of like trying because it's it's about more about like industry things or marketing or, or cultural things so it kind of makes sense but i don't know i, I think i can I'm terrible at coming up with titles like i'm really terrible at coming up with titles um Anyway, so we want to talk about, we want to go back to last time we, we previewed some books and left off a ton of stuff and all that. Um, and there are a couple that I wanted to add, and I think you said you had some too. But first, there was um, a Wall Street Journal article about uh, Bottom's Dream, the Arnold Schmidt book they talked about, this 1,500 pages long. And this has, the article is kind of dumb because it's basically just like, this book is really big. It's a big ass book. <laughs> like all the quotes, you'd love this. So it's the, some of the statistics are are kind of funny. It is thirteen pounds and has a fourteen inch spine, which is wow, really gigantic. I think they mean from top to bottom. Like it's fourteen inches tall. Oh, the trim size. Yeah, because I don't think that the looking even at the picture, the spine's width that doesn't look like that's fourteen inches to me. When That's it, like the Oxford English Dictionary. It looks something. like the Oxford English Dictionary in the picture. They have Ben Rybeck from uh, from Brazos reading it, looking very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> but their quotes. The funniest one that I saw. Uh, well, there's one Tony Messenger who I know listens to the program, and the podcast sometimes at least, and is a book blogger in Australia. He said that when he got it, his plan was to read five pages a day so that he would finish it in a year, and then open it up and realize that that was way that was not going to happen. So he's planning on doing it over a two year period, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and then the best is I know this story because he mentioned on Facebook, but Dave Auerbach, who writes for Slate. Um, spent like an hour talking to the reporter about like the backdrop to like Arno Schmidt, why this book's important, like all the, the kind of aesthetic and contextual things related to the book itself. And the quote that they used from him in the article is this. My five-year-old daughter can usually lift packages that come to our house, said Dave Auerbach, a tech columnist for Slate. She couldn't lift this one. <laughs> Mr. Auerbach says he reads it on the floor. That's it. <laughs> Which I just think is great because, like, they, they don't even bother trying to explain what the shit this book's really all in. I don't know, I don't know that anyone's going to be able to read this before in time. To, like, I don't know how this book gets reviewed. I mean, I have time. Somebody wants to give me some money to read this book. I, I'm out here. But how long do you think it would take you to read? Because, it's. I mean, it is like Finnegan's Wake where you're diving off down rabbit holes on every word. Like I can't. How long do you think? How long do you think it would take you to read this fifteen hundred page book? 
I don't know how many how many pages do you think you could actually read a day? Twenty, maybe. I think I think if you actually are reading it, it really is maybe ten. If and if, and that would be like going all in, and that would take a day. Like when I've been reading Finnegan's Wake for like the the year last year, um, I would spend every Tuesday, and my plan was I had to read like I forget what it was. It was like fifteen pages a week or something like that, and it would all it all balance out. But I would spend every Tuesday night. And there were many times that because of like the intricacies and like figuring out what these references are or like if something is a joke or what the what it what it means and all the different interpretations. And the way that the the way that you had to to read it wasn't just going forward. It was like spinning out and like looking things up online. There are many weeks where I could only read like four pages and that was like and it would be like four hours of reading. Jesus. I wouldn't be surprised. And it was like incredibly enjoyable figuring out weird things or like suddenly getting or rereading things and getting it or seeing like why certain things are funny or like how it connects. And it was it was super enjoyable. It was like a really enjoyable reading process, but it was not like any other book that I've ever read where you just kind of can keep going forward. It wasn't like reading like um like just to use an example because I've been listening to the audiobook, The Underground Railroad, the Colson Whitehead book, where you just it propels. The, and I think that this Arnold Schmidt book is pretty – is in that vein where it doesn't propel. <laughs> Trying to do math on <laughs> – if you read 10 pages a day, it would still take you – Five months. Almost five months, yes. Good God. So I, I wonder if anyone – yeah, the book the, – this genius that this is the article because this is the only article you can get. <laughs> right. Unless someone, unless it's someone like I don't even know if Orth, I know Orthofer is very familiar with Arno Schmidt. He wrote a book about Arno Schmidt um, <clears throat> that came out a year or so ago, and he's a huge fan. I, I assume that he's read this in German, but maybe I'm wrong. But he might be the only person I know that would have read it in German that would be able to write a review of it because he could sort of, you know, at least look at it and have read it in the past. I mean, right, but has he read it in the past? I, I mean, have no idea. I know that he's read, he wrote a book about Schmidt, so I, if, I feel like if you did that, you probably sh- have, since this is his big book. But maybe not, and I can't grab the, his book from here. It's like, it's just out of my reach to be able to check. Um, so I don't know. But it would have to be someone like that, right? Like someone who's like a huge German scholar who knows all all about German literature and about Arno Schmidt in German, and then read. He has a wow. Nope. Okay, so here's what he says about it on his website. He says, "Why we haven't reviewed it yet? Haven't been able to set aside the several hundred reading hours required. Chances that we will review it. Good. It's one of my life's ambitions to make it through this." Well, so. It'll be, it'll be like the New York Review of Books model, where they just review whatever they want, whenever. Uh, six months from now, no big deal. Yeah, I mean that's fine. I, they they said that they sold the old, like this too that they printed two thousand copies of it, and that one thousand of them were sold to bookstores. Yeah, and I mean, uh, <laughs> ordered. That doesn't mean they're going to sell them. But and uh, according to Green Apple, they have sold two. Uh, yeah, it's become a little bit of a like a. Twitter thing for I like saw that. people who buy it, like posting selfies. So I'm looking, I'm looking at the article, and there's a photo here from um, Ben Ryback at Brazos of the book sitting. It's above its staff recommendations. Which let's not kid anyone. No one has read this book. How are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, who's staff rec- Is that Mark? Mark, you yeah. liar. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't read this. That's a good point. But. Maybe they can't fit it anywhere else. Anyway, that's what they said. Gigantic. Poor. uh, I think that's Morrow's book next to it. It is. Um, And it it just dwarfs it. And that's our book right there. Morrow's book is like 350 pages or something. Yeah. His. Yeah. But his book is also a normal size. (laughs) Normal normal size book. This is true. (laughs) This has you have to have your own table to read this. Right. You need to get dedicated. Yeah, desk. Hey, they, have, this. they have two open letter books on this display. Go Brazos. Love it. They have, oh, because like this is the other big book. That's a book that I want to read this fall is Jerusalem by Ellen Moore. That's on there towards the bottom. That book is published. I just got the copy. Um, I had a galley, but I hate reading the galleys of books that are like 
that long because they always crack and fall apart. Um, and they did the 2666 model where you can buy the hardcover or you can buy the, the slipcase three volume paperback mm-hmm. version. Um, and that is the, it's the one on the bottom. You're looking at the same picture. It's not the very bottom row. It's the one up from that. And it's two to the left of the brother. That book is gigantic and it looks like it's dwarfed <laughs> yeah. by, by bottom's dream dwarfed. So yeah. Two Maggie Nelson books here. Are there? Yeah, the the third shelf down on the left, that's a Maggie Nelson book that I'm totally blanking on the title of. The one with the woman's picture? Yeah. I can't see that one very well, yeah. I'm, I'm just totally blanking on the title. I think it's the one about the, the murder. I think it's the one that Red Parts oh. follows up on. Okay. Anyway, we should move on. What yeah. were your... I had two books I wanted to add on to our, our thing that I'd recommend. Um, both of which I've been reading a lot for uh, books I'm going to teach in my class in the spring. And I have like a, a pretty good plan now. I just need to make a few decisions. And I might post some of these on, on 3% because whatever, because sometimes people are interested. Um, and I have, to, I have to pare it down just a bit. But one of them that I read for this was uh, is called Savage Theories by Pola... And this is, I can't really pronounce her last name, so I think it's Ola Zarak, but I believe that this, if I remember the story right, her name, this is her name backwards, or it's like, it's, the letters are rearranged. I don't think this is really her name, but it's um, O-L-O-I-X-A-R-A-C, which I have no idea how you'd say that. Anyways, this was um, her first novel, Savage Theories, and it's coming out from Soho in January, I believe, and I think Roy Kesey is the name of the translator. Um and it's I really, really, really enjoyed this book in part because it it didn't it doesn't fit together. It doesn't make sense in the way that a normal book makes sense. There's like a couple different plot lines that never really connect. Um and in the middle there's like sort of an academic uh this woman creating this academic idea or expounding upon this academic idea that doesn't also really necessarily connect. There's a lot of things that are like sort of parallel or sort of reflect each other, but not really. Um, and it makes fun of a lot. It's a big satire of, of academia and Lacanianism and all this sort of stuff that, uh, you imagine with like the Argentine university system and has like insane amounts of sex scenes in it. So it's, it's a fun book. I really, I really enjoyed reading it. I wasn't sure what to expect. And when I started it, I just enjoyed being like baffled by not knowing what could possibly come next or how any of this kind of came together. And it, and I don't know that it really does come together, but it was one of the books that fit my scheme for titles. I want to teach at least half of the books I want to use in the spring are books that I feel like I have to read twice because they don't get them the first time through. And I want to do that because I think it'll be more interesting to, to, to have some of these books that fit into that. And the other one that fits into this style exactly, and I'm not finished with it yet because we've had uh, authors and translators here for the past week, so I haven't been reading anything, but it's called Between Dog and Wolf by Sasha Sokolov. He had um, a book called The School for Fools that was published a few, in a few translations and has been around for a number of years. That's like kind of a cult classic that um, New York Review of Books reissued last year in a new translation. And this book is was his follow-up to that, and it's super crazy because like there's two there's two narrators um that are one's writing a letter the other is like writing a sort of russian classic russian sort of book about life is life and whatever and then there's a series of poems there's four sections of poems there's 18 parts to it the way that it's like the numbers are structured and the way that the book is structured and how they the sections repeat is like intricate it's supposed to be like his his like opposite style from what school for fools was it's sort of they they compare it to finnegan's wake i think in the back which it's not but it is it is in the sense that like the plot is so secondary so much of it is more about this voice and one of the characters is like this rural dumb dude so he's got like the like kind of all over the place reminds me a bit of horrible with like this kind of ongoing Lagoria of like speech that that just kind of flows and, and goes all over the place and it, I've I really enjoyed reading it and I know that I don't understand shit and that when I reread it I'll be like okay this is a section where I sort of maybe this all connects this way or here's like the general scheme and rereading it will will deepen that but the other reason I wanted to mention it is that it's the first book in Columbia's Russian Library series which I can't find their their official press release. I think it was, I think they sent it with the book and I probably lost it, but I believe this was the series that the Russian government was going to do with Overlook, but that deal fell apart. And my understanding was that they were going to publish 100 books of like pre-modern, modern modern, and contemporary literature of all genres. 
Um, and after it fell apart with uh, Overlook, Columbia agreed to do it. It doesn't specify that there's 100 books now on their website, but they have three coming out this fall in December. Um, Between Dog and Wolf by Sasha Sokolov, then 14 Little Red Huts and Other Plays by Plotinov, and Strolls with Pushkin by someone named Andrei Sayanovsky, who I don't know. Um, and they're all, like, branded similarly. They have, like, interesting sort of Russian-looking covers or, like, that kind of uh, Russian formalist um, sort of covers. And it's cool that they are doing this. I don't know. I, they, it's going to be crazy. If they end up doing 100 Russian books over whatever number of years, that would be a wild addition to, like, world literature. But it is, it is, and it's a nice series, and it's cool that they're going ahead with it. Uh, it was supposed to be, I think, 100 books over 10 years. So that's what I, okay, so yeah, it's not listed on their website that way, but that's what my understanding was, too. But that was the Overlook thing, and that's just the mayor being ambitious. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's still happening. I love the cover. I do, too. Uh, I like the, all three of them. I think they're, they're, that's the kind of thing that if I saw these in the story, I'd be like, I would like all of these to match. I would like the set. Yeah. Um, going back to the Savage uh, theories. Yeah. Abby actually gave me a copy when she was here for the Neba, uh, and she told me, Chad is crazy about this book. I'm giving you a copy. So I sent her so many text messages of my interpretation of that book that she probably never wants to talk to me again. But I do have a copy, so uh, I'm not sure that it's a book that you'll love, but I think that some of our listeners will love. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention one book which I totally forgot about, just because um, they're so small a publisher that they somehow get overlooked quite a bit in these. Um, Roundups, and it's from the Dorothy uh, publishers. I was going to mention that too. Perfect. Uh, the Suite for Barbara Loden by Nathalie Leger, and it's translated from the French by Natasha Lehrer and Cécile Menon. Um, this is, we sold a lot of copies of this in French oh, when right. I was working at Albertine. It was a little cult classic. Um, and it's very hard to explain very succinctly, so I'm just going to read their their copy and it makes perfect sense it says i believe there is a miracle in wanda wrote marguerite duras the only american the only film american actress barbara lode never wrote and directed usually there is a distance between representation and text subject and action here that distance is completely eradicated it is perhaps this miracle the seeming collapse of fiction and fact that has made wanda from May 1970 a cult classic and the fascination of artists from isabelle Huppert to rachel kushner to kate zambrano for acclaimed French writer Nathalie Leger, the mysteries of Wanda launched an obsessive quest across continents into archives and through mining towns of Pennsylvania, all to get closer to the film and, make, and its maker. Sweet for Barbara Loden is the magnificent, magnificent result. So yes, um, it's you know a little bit biography, a little bit memoir. It's a little bit just you know straight up like difficult journalism. It's film criticism. It's all sorts of things thrown together. Uh, I have not read it yet. I tried to read it in French and was a little uh, distracted and couldn't really get into it. Um, but it's now out from Dorothy, and uh, uh, we own a copy, and uh, I'm going to read it as soon as Emma's done with it. So, Yeah, I, I had a copy because they sent it to me, and I was really excited about it. And then um, the uh, so one of, my, one of my interns was going to review it, and uh, she has it <laughs> and hasn't written a review, so... She's listening to this. She should write, write the review because that would be great. But um, hopefully we'll get another one and I'll be able to read it then. But she there read the back and was like, this sounds amazing. Yeah. There are burbs, blurbs from Emer McBride, Valeria Luiselli, um, Brad Johnson of Diesel Books, Joanna Walsh. It's uh, Everyone loves this book. Everyone's been waiting for it to come out in English for a long time. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And they, Dorothy does a lot of great stuff. Yes, they do. So that's it on the books front. Trying to be organized there. We okay. actually have a we actually have an, a schedule <laughs> written Up down. Next, uh, this is where we get into the silly part of the podcast. Yep. So we got at our three percent uh, podcast at Gmail email address. When did this come in? Many many months ago. Oh really? Things that I don't check because they're not on my phone. Oh, no, it came in September. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, September 12th. That's like two weeks ago. 
All right. I thought I was much older. So the entire email is as follows. I'm not sure if this would be of interest. Da, da, da. We started doing video reviews of books, video reviews in capital letters. These are advertorials, and there's a link to a YouTube page with a video, which we can talk about in a second. It says, we guarantee a minimal number of views depending on the package. We started 5,000 guaranteed views for $250. Our site's readership is over 5 million, see attached, so it's not hard to hit that. Then there's a screenshot of what they allege is are there um to put it, uh, this is their this is the see, data from the website yeah and like that the, that the, five million is a bullshit number it is especially when you actually click on the video which i'm going to do hopefully it doesn't just start auto playing it does but just hit pause right away because you get you get like three seconds before the sound starts okay um oh shit i don't want to it opened in my email. All right. <laughs> which the video has 1,276 views, which is 1, far 1, shy of the 5,000 5, they guarantee. Barry, and if you look at their other ones, <laughs> which are my favorite, <laughs> they are. Wow. How on earth did I get here? Um, there's like 600 views, 700 yeah. views. It's it's Hollywood I, candies this year ninety three views, some things handmade finger puppets thirty four. The lava lamps for Halloween, which is my personal favorite, because the guy puts on a, a like a scary voice, is one hundred and forty seven views. And this is nowhere near the numbers that they claim that they are. It's it's very bizarre and it's uh, verifiable because it's fucking on YouTube. Right, I know I, they they really should have thought this through before running this little scam um i'm trying to find the actual so it's this website called famadillo yeah yep and you go there it's it's um just a bunch of video reviews of things for the family and some of them aren't even video reviews like the one for today is the meatball shop that is about tomato sauce that's right nair products <laughs> fruit shoots like what is this none of this relates to books at all let's go i'm going to the books category they have two three four four and a half um book reviews they're all kids books with the exception of well one of them is called miracle man the story of jesus and one is called restoring flexibility a gently yoga based practice to increasing mobility at any age I mean, if these people are actually doing this... And there's no video. If they are making a living off of family tips, travel, and tidbits, God bless them. (laughs) But the the production value and the, the recommendations are just... So the video itself is a book on a, I don't know, their kitchen table? Yeah, I think that's about right. It appears as though the camera is mounted to the person's forehead <laughs> as they turn the pages and talk about the book. For two and a half and, minutes. And it's bizarre. It, I don't know. Yeah. So it turns out that this would be of interest to us because I'm baffled <laughs> by this and I cannot imagine anyone. Also, God. you didn't mention the name of the book that's being reviewed is Teeth Berries. A baby teeth tradition. Yeah. And it's got a doll. It's how, I mean, I don't understand how people, how did this woman find (laughs) us? That's kind of, that's maybe the biggest question is like, what, what search was she doing that led her to our podcast in a way in which she found the email address and thought that she should send it to us? Do you think she was just looking for a book podcast? Probably, but if you Google, I mean, I feel like our SEO stuff not is like not great because we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't go crazy the way that lots of other people do. We're not book riot, so I want to know if like did book riot get this? I hope so. Yeah, we're not even. We're, if you type in book podcast, it's not. We don't show up on, on Google, and then there's like the 25 outstanding podcasts for readers, and we're we're not one of those 25 apparently. 
which is bullshit and wrong. And this whole list is garbage. But uh, but yeah, I don't know how she would have found us. It's very, very strange, especially if it's like family related, like. I'm sorry. Like we're probably not not the family friendly podcast that she'd like it to be. I don't, yeah, I don't understand how we we're, certainly we're not on like some list of publishers or whatever, right? No, I don't think so. I don't think we show up on any of those things because we don't we don't do enough of our like own self promotion the way that you have to to be getting onto those kind of lists. Right. We're just not. We're just bad at that. I think. Yeah, too too little time or disinterested. I maybe disinterested. Maybe <laughs> might be a way to do it. Um, but this reminded me that every morning in the shelf awareness email, let me let me find one here, which I don't know if you get. I but, do. Um, they have so they have news and notes, which minor quibble here. They're basically the same thing. <laughs> in their, <laughs> According to their definition of news and notes, you could put either one of these things in either place. <laughs> Mind quibble. But at the bottom of notes, there's always a book trailer of the day. Yeah. Who the fuck is watching these things? I have still no idea. funding the production of these things? The one, the one, the one that's today is um, book trailer of the day is Bitty Bot. <laughs> that's right. And a second one that's Fuddles and Puddles. That's also correct. I'm not <laughs> clicking on either one of these. I was going to ask you, because I remember a few years ago, it was sort of a big deal. I always have one of my, in my publishing, the publishing class I teach, um, there's one class session where we watch a bunch of, because we talk about marketing and all sorts of things like that and reaching readers and reaching readers in a digital environment um, versus reaching readers in a physical bookstore based environment and trailers come up and we watch like a bunch of them. They're like the Gary Steingart, super sad, true love story. One, the one that, um, they did for, uh, Oh shit. What is it called? The, uh, the guest, the, it's not the guest, but the book that, um, that Lauren Stein translated for FSG. The mystery guest, mystery guest. Yeah. yeah. The mystery guest. Um, and a few other like random ones. I'll just find like new ones and we'll watch those. And it, Everyone, no, no one ever wants to buy the book or read the book after watching those trailers, and nobody ever encounters trailers at all. This is shelf awareness is the only place that I see them ever. They ever even enter into my world, right? Which and average readers don't get this, as far as I, I mean, they can. It's they, these yeah. side support, but I assume just booksellers and publishers read this. I think it, it, so. Uh, is to maybe get booksellers more excited about this? Let do, me just go ahead and say, no, that's not working. Do, 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 is there any other thing? Are, have book trailers, like, have they just peaked? I mean, I guess not because they're making them. But, like, do people really still consider that a valid way of you, creating marketing? marketing no. Okay. Because also, I, like, they're not, they're not showing. Like, I remember talking with Derek, Harold Augenbaum a million years ago um, when trailers were becoming a thing and him saying, like, I don't, he didn't understand why, like, Borders, I think Borders is around at that time, didn't have TV screens in certain sections that would be screening trailers for books that maybe they had on, uh, like, a, on display or whatever. So you could, it could somehow maybe rope people in who are in the store who would see one of these short trailers and be like, oh, okay, I'll just grab that book then. It's right here. Um, and that, I don't think would be great, but I, it, it at least makes some degree of sense, but I don't see them anywhere. Uh, I agree. Why didn't that ever happen? That's kind of bizarre. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it would be the only way in which that would, that you could justify the existence of these things. I mean, my kids are on YouTube fucking nonstop. Like the children these days don't, I don't think they know how to talk on the phone. <laughs> that might be a point in, in favor of that, that panel that you're talking about. Because they just don't use the phone, but um, but uh, they're also on YouTube all the time, and I don't think they've ever said like, "Oh, we just saw this book trailer, and we really want to buy this book." <laughs> like, that's never come up. Instead, it's like dogs and doing funny things. Yeah, it's a. I mean, I suppose when they first came out, when somebody decided I'm going to make a book trailer, they were counting on you know YouTube, uh, you know, being linked to from. Facebook and Twitter and all of that sort of thing, right? Yeah, that's what I would assume. Too. And something would become, quote, viral. Uh, but 
that doesn't that I mean I don't see that anymore. No one no one in my Twitter feed puts book trailers up ever. Yeah. That's not a thing that happens. I don't and clearly the publishers must have realized that this was just not actually selling books in the end. I would right? assume so when I when I just typed in YouTube book trailers, YouTube has a they, the first thing that comes up is a cha- I don't know if it's a channel, but it's an individual that's called Book Trailers for All. And then YA Book Trailers, one for Divergent, um, a book trailer category, but it, all the books that are listed look to be kids' books, um, a kids' book YouTube trailer, book trailers from Random House Kids, and Harper Teen. I feel like maybe it, they, they do still try and do it in like the YA genre. Right. I suppose if you have the next uh, Hunger Games or whatever – you could possibly get them excited for that sort of thing via a book trailer. We had uh, Josephine Klugart and her um, Danish uh, publisher, uh, Jakob Sandvold, were here over the weekend for an event that we did. And I drove them to campus because they wanted to see our, our office. And as we were driving in, there's this huge group of people, these kids out playing in this lawn. I was like, do you see all those those kids? And they're like, yeah. It's like, they're playing they're playing that, that um, oh shoot, what's it called? Quidditch. If they were playing Quidditch on the lawn with like a whole setup and all that, and like from the Harry Potter game, and they're like, why do people do that? Do, why, do Americans really play this fake game? It's like, apparently, they, they, they play all the time out here and take over this whole big space. So, is that, is that true? It really? is. There's even, a, there's even a World Cup of Quidditch, World Championships. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. So. Anyways, yeah, so I think I have videos. You wanted to talk about I Love Dick for a minute, too, didn't you? Well, I just, I, I would like to, uh, I feel like we've barely mentioned it and mentioned that you were in, you were in the trailer or in the um, pilot episode uh, in the background there at that party. A lot. <laughs> a lot. You are somehow not in the still that we have here on the Flavor Wire review. Oh, but yeah. You very easily could have been. Yes, it was. I was. It was crazy because I, I think I told part of the story on here before, so I'm probably repeating myself. But when I that was how I ended up meeting everyone in Marfa was being in that there were like a hundred, there were over a hundred extras that were there for that scene or that day of shooting, and we spent so much time together. That that's kind of how I met everyone, and like afterwards, be able to see them, and be like, oh yeah, you were part of this thing too, and hung out with everyone, and it was it was great. And then watching it, I was I was all prepared. I was super prepared because I didn't talk to people here in Rochester a lot about like Marfa and its and its craziness and how much I loved it and like what was interesting about the other people and what was how their lives were really cool and the things that they were doing and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that I could use this this pilot to be like, okay, here's all these people and like spin off stories from it. And then we watched it and I was like, most all of those people that I knew are not in there at all. And it's it's, it's so trimmed down in terms of like who got on there. And then I started, was like, why am I in here so frequently? Like from the <laughs> beginning onwards, like it's a lot um, comparatively. Cause I keep showing up in the background or walking through. So, um, Maybe you have some like preternatural sense for when they're actually nailing the scene yeah. and you just happen to wander in every, every take that they ended up using. You were right there. So in that still though, there's a guy's face that's right in between Catherine Hahn and Kevin Bacon. Um, that's looking uh, towards the screen, t- towards the- he's a bartender. Is he not a bartender? He is a bartender. Um, okay. I met him on the bus because he was reading a Delky archive book and he's a huge open letter fan and crush and heart guy fan. Wow. Yep. I met him in the lost horse saloon after the, after the, the thing too. And he, he was going on and on about all the books and he's like, he's like exactly our, he probably, I don't know that he listens to the podcast, but he would because he's into our thing. So random. Very random. Very random. But yeah. But Marfa, did, oh God. If, if someone asked me what how to describe Marfa, I would just say very random. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So what did you think of the show though? Um I had some issues with um the way the plot had been changed. Mostly the uh the addition of the playwright neighbor woman. Um like look, for anyone who hasn't read the book. Uh, this is not at all how this happens in the book. This, 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 uh, meet cute, let's call it, takes place at, uh, Dick's home, which is in 
the suburbs of Los Angeles where um, Silver and Chris go to his house for dinner. Yeah, uh, or no, they, go, they, go to, they go out to dinner and they end up at his house after. Yeah. So the one but dinner it, scene sort of makes sense. Right, but it's somewhere near, it's in the suburbs of L.A. It's not this big, huge party um, that, that, that predominates the whole thing. And it's also near both of their homes. Like Chris and Silver go home after they meet him. The next day, they stay overnight. But, Right, but they go home, and then but Dick is at home as well. So there's no like, it doesn't happen in Marfa. Um, there's no this whole whatever fellowship that Silver has. All of that, none of that exists in the book. Um, I don't know. I I still have a hard time figuring out why they decided on Marfa, but I think you know, um, you know I think there are two things. One was um, I think the the real reason is that Jill and Eileen Jill Soloway is making it, and Eileen Miles lives in Marfa. And okay. there's that connection because they were going out for a while, I believe. Um, and I think that that had something to do with it, that they liked the the Marfa, the ability to do it. Kevin Bacon has some, he donates money to the high school in Marfa, uh, I think on an annual basis. So I think he has some connection to there too. So I think it maybe it was maybe that plus they can probably do it there fairly cheap. Right. Anyway, there's also, my whole point was, there's no playwright character. And I did not understand the involvement. I didn't see the the need to create that character. I, yeah, my, my, my gut feeling was that the the woman who wrote the script, I can't remember her name now, um, but she's written like one other script maybe, um, that she started, she, she created that character and that character is supposed to be like an analog to her as the person who's taking this. Um, intense love affair and this book that has been written about it and writing a new version of it. Um, and that, that, that she can use this character as a sort of mirror or whatever to that process. But I don't think it's necessary either. I didn't think it, I didn't think that I didn't like that part much at all. Um, but the rest of it, I thought like, look, you know, this is a book about uh, critical theory. Yeah. Mostly. <laughs> uh, so that's impossible to put on screen. I thought they did a decent job of getting Chris's sort of personality onto the screen. Um, Dick, I will say, is not quite what I would have thought. I mean, mostly in the book, he's just sort of totally unaware of anything that's happening for a long time, right? He doesn't know. They don't send in the letters. Right. Right? He doesn't understand that Chris is obsessed with him. They don't have any contact for months until she and, faxes him. Yeah, right. It, it, it's a it's a while, right? Uh, he just, he, yeah, a little bubble. He's oblivious to the whole thing. Whereas here, Kevin Bacon playing Dick sort of knows from the first second what's going on, and it it's a that's a little different. Um, but otherwise, I thought it was good. I, I enjoyed watching it for you know the whatever it was half hour. I. It'll be curious. To, it, it sort of feels like they've set it up to become this sort of predictable sort of thing. So I hope they don't do the predictable sort of thing. I, that's interesting. I thought that it was setting it up so that it could start out as something that people are comfortable with as a form and then evolve as Chris's voice evolves and becomes more of the critical theory and her interaction with the patriarchy. The, her taking the class of his um, is an addition to that I think could be not right. great. Yeah, it's a little too easy. Exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. It seems like they're they're setting it up to be a predictable thing. Yeah. I just hope that they do something interesting with that expectation. It's unclear to me if this has been picked up or not. Yeah, the variety thing you sent this morning or whenever Friday um, was not exactly uh, you know confirmed that it was happening. Yeah, just, and there's nothing new after that. Hmm, I don't know. It, yeah, it's unclear. But uh, it probably will be, you'd think. Because didn't she just win more awards for Transparent? I think so. Um, I would think, like, look, if Amazon really wants, like, the, the last thing I wanted to do this morning when I woke up was give Amazon advice. But if Amazon really wants to, like, get in this, it feels like if they're, they should greenlight all three of these shows that they did pilots for, mm-hmm. it just... See what sticks to the wall. Like maybe 
one of the actors gets nominated for an Emmy, you know, I'm not saying they need to win. Maybe, you know, just, just being there, you know, uh, gives them a little bit of credibility. And if, you know, the more shows you create, especially more shows like this, that sort of, you know, are for whatever, you know, purposes, let's call it edgy or different or prestige or whatever you want to call those types of shows, the more they do, the, the better chance they have of catching somebody's eye and, and maybe getting some critical acclaim, you know? Are you, uh, you I bet you're not. Do you know how many um, pilots they have put out? You mean this year or? No, probably? over, they have had eight pilot seasons. Um, and it is probably 50 or so shows. The number of shows that they have that they that they distribute and they made through their studios is, is I mean, they've only been doing it for a couple of years, um, is kind of a lot, like wow. surprisingly a lot. So like there's five dramas, including Men in the High Castle, which got, I think it got, so yeah, there's a second season coming out of that. There's uh, six comedies, including Transparent. There's a bunch of children's programs, which is, I do know about because my kids watch one of them, two of them, I think. Um, and then they have a couple other things that, that are in there, but then they've had, um, of the, the, they have a lot of future programming, but of the pilots that didn't make it there, there are a lot, there's a remarkably high number that they've done of like a single episode and then just didn't continue it. Interesting. But I I'd say they should do it. I'd say just... they should do these three. I mean, the, the Jean-Claude Van Damme one, they're like, that one got the highest ratings and then the tick one people seem to love. So. And this is a serious one or, you know, more something. I hope right. they do. Yeah. But but it was fun. I think I, I agree with you. I, we talked about it when we both watched it that night that it's like it's impossible book to replicate in the medium of TV or visually in a way that seems satisfactory to the original content. Yes. But if you've only if you're just encountering it in this way, I think, you know, it, I would consider it a good TV show, and I would consider it intriguing. Yeah, it's, when you're so attached to the book itself, to watch it that way, it's a little weird. You know? Yeah, I agree. Was, was there anything else that we were going to talk about on here? No, nope. you wanted to rant about a thing with a bad name. I don't want to give it away. It's your, it's your little rant. Oh, that what was that thing called? This is so dumb. Um, Literally. <laughs> literistic yeah literistic which i believe is an app that you can pay to subscribe to that will then update you on contests that you can pay to submit your writing to but the main thing was just to point out that it's called literistic which is fucking stupid so Sweet. stupid <laughs> okay we scour the internet for deadlines that you'll actually want to hear about no adverts sponsored listings or exceptions for friends exceptions for friends is that a thing i don't know um, thoughtfully unique, uniquely created just for you. Each list of deadlines is filtered through your subscriber preferences. Basically, if you're a poet or a novelist, right? Yep. Filter out unwanted genres, reading fees, or listings that don't pay. Every month for the following month, build regular submissions into your writing schedule. Find out a whole new mags and increase the odds of getting published. This is just... Okay, I'm going to read this. Literistic was born of a frustration. As a writer, managing deadlines is a headache. Finding out about upcoming deadlines is a matter of spending hours trawling large advertisement-supported databases. These databases, where are they? What are these databases? I don't know. This is often convoluted, hard to navigate, and full of irrelevant listings. The search for... The search for pay for poems or for a fellowship at a swanky but small and conveni conveniently located college is too often unsuccessful. It's a search that inspires aimless procra and pro aimlessness and procrastination, making the maxim of submit widely and submit often difficult to realize. Is that a maxim? I don't think so. <laughs> vote early. Okay. Vote often. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's, that's one. <laughs> you should be submitting more, but you aren't, and we weren't, and that stinks. So, wow. Like, there... For four eighty three a month or fifty eight dollars a year, you get a you get a, a list. You get you get a list sent to you. You get an app. View a list. I'm going to click on this just out of curiosity. Oh my god, there are thousands of things. And the thing that did you click on the like what it looks like? No, where's that? Oh, it's oh. down the left side. It says check out what there does literistic actually look like. Uh, I don't know what that is. It but, looks like a newsletter. Yes. It was just like endless, endless dates of things. And then 
There are just hyperlinks. Yep. Yep. They just aggregated. They're aggregating information and selling it. This is such a, like, today's new economy way of existing. Like, I'm surprised they don't have a Patreon to get this going. Kind of, kind of, of all the people to try to take advantage of in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Poor struggling writers. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can pay us $58 a year, and then we'll tell you about all the other ways that you cannot get your book published. <laughs> so you can see... <laughs> You can see in in excruciating detail how many places are going to reject you. Right. Great. Um, so I'm also going to rant because uh, there's just no other way to spin this thing. It, oh, we'll see. So um, in terms of the bookstore slash bar that we're opening, we've hit a bit of a snag uh, in terms of getting our liquor license. And that is because per... Providence law, um, you are not allowed to operate an establishment that sells alcohol, be it a liquor store. or um, All we have is liquor stores here. You can't buy alcohol anywhere but a liquor store. Um, or a bar or a restaurant that has alcohol. You cannot be within 200 feet of a church or a school. We are not within 200 feet of a school, but we are within 200 feet of a school administrative building, which they claim uh, also has after-school programs, blah, blah, blah. So students are there, whatever. Not, you know, not a disaster because we can get uh, what's called a spot exemption, um, where they, they allow us to have the, the liquor license, even though we're within 200 square feet of, or 200 feet of that building. Problem is, this being Rhode Island, uh, the convoluted way in which one gets a spot exemption is through the state legislature, not the city. Oh. And the state legislature, this being a very small state, is part time. And they do not convene again until January. So we cannot get so they basically we have to get our local uh, state senator, uh, a gentleman I met the other day at the uh, neighborhood block party. Um, <laughs> he's a very nice guy. Uh, Met him the other day, and um, so we he has to sponsor a bill, which will then be presented in state senate and go through the machinations, and hopefully six weeks later come out a bill. And uh, so we can't do that until January, oh meaning realistically we're not going to get our liquor license until February or early March. So the plan now is to open in March. Which is fine because construction on our space um, is going slower than uh, anticipated, as you know, it's usually the case in these things. Um, but the silver lining, if there is any to be had at all, is that uh, we will have time to plan every last detail mm -hmm. and make sure that we open um, with our, you know, best face, and uh, everything will be in place and ready to go. And I talked to somebody at um, Neba actually who was rushing to try to get open for an initial Christmas season the way we were trying to do it. And she said, um, you know, November came around and she's like, I, it, it just seems totally overwhelming. And then the possibility of, you know, very empty January and February was too much. It's better to do it open in the spring. So that makes sense. It does make sense, but you know, we're getting antsy sitting yeah. here, um, jobless. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, so. That's that's where we are. So Riff Raff, the, the bookstore bar is coming, uh, but it's coming more quickly than anticipated. Realistically, we probably weren't going to get open in, in November anyway, just because of the construction thing. But it was giving us hope. <laughs> right. And it sucks that you have to wait for such a for for such a dumb technical reason. Yeah, exactly. Like, so. yeah, if you had it and you if you, the liquor license was taken care of and you just didn't get the construction done and chose to open in February, that would be different, I think. Yes, exactly. That's, so. That sucks. That's crazy. That has to be a bill. <laughs> Is that just like a like something else? Yeah, like there's, <laughs> there's discussion, apparently. You know, uh, none of this is fact, but discussion rumors that they're going to get rid of that 200 feet um, rule and um, just adjudicate everything on a case-by-case -case basis because – it is just a weird holdover rule, and it's only in Providence at this point. Oh, I could wow. go to Pawtucket, the next town over, and we could have a liquor license in three weeks and be oh, done. Oh, man. Just, just a weird puritanical holdover. This state has some weird liquor laws. Uh -huh. um, 
look, I grew up in Connecticut where, you know, they're infamously like just strict, like in Connecticut, you can't buy alcohol after 8 PM at a liquor store and you can only buy alcohol at a liquor store. Yeah, we have, I think ours is nine. What? And, but that's not a New York state thing. Yeah, it is. It, 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 it's outside of New York. There's New York city and then there's New York state and, um, yeah. and outside the liquor stores close at nine. Wow. And on yeah. Sundays you can't have, you can't serve alcohol until noon. And um, they just changed that. Cuomo was here last week at one of the breweries that's doing like a huge expansion and announced that they're eliminating that so you can start serving uh, booze on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Because otherwise they're killing like all brunch service. Like you wouldn't go to brunch on Sunday if you can't have oh, a okay. mimosa, right? Right. It's okay. Yeah. Oddly, Rhode Island doesn't have those laws. It's But, you know, you can't, can't sell... We have no happy hours. You're not allowed to discount alcohol. Whoa, really? Yeah, really. That's very strange. It is strange. Um, and they have these uh, laws. So basically, I, I tried to explain this in text, but uh, in New York, you can get the beer and wine license and then the alcohol license. Yes. Yeah. In Rhode Island, it doesn't work that way. It's, you know, all or nothing, but it's based on what sort of establishment you want to run. And so there's the restaurant one, which they try to get most people to have because it guarantees that there'll be food so that people aren't getting drunk or whatever. Then they have the uh, neighborhood bar license, which is was originally meant for like, you know, these gentlemen's clubs of which there are still actually a few around here. The old Italian sort of clubs that are not open to the public, but um, are able to sell alcohol to their members. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but those have to close at midnight and then you can get a club license, which, you know, if you're a dance club or whatever and all these things, um, and there are various other sort of arrangements that have to be made to, to qualify for each of these different things. It's, you know, this is why you hire a lawyer so he can navigate through these things. But yeah, it's not as straightforward as, as somewhere like New York city. That's for sure. Yeah. But they, they realize, I think, that these laws are sort of old fashioned and it's, pro, you know, preventing sort of expansion of business and that sort of thing. So they're trying to address it. It's just, it's very slow moving. So, yeah, I can imagine. So you just have to, and you have to balance like different interests. Right. Of course. It's very, uh, it's frustrating, but you know, we'll get there in the end. That's yeah. All oh man. Well, hopefully I was passed through instantly and I'll be taken care of. Yeah, the state senators seem to think it was no problem whatsoever. Oh, so, that's good. That's yeah. good. So then you guys can work on it this fall and not feel too, too bad. Right. Okay, well, anyway. I think that's all I have for this week because I have to go teach now. All right. You enjoy that. Which will be – it'll be fun. There, All the students came to the event last Friday, so they have that to talk about. And then we're talking about how long it takes to – from – finding out a book to getting it reviewed somewhere and sold, how much time that takes and all the steps. I'm going to guess that they assume that it's like a three month process. That's usually the case. And then I, when I end up being, when it ends up being two years, they're like, wow, holy shit. <laughs> like last week I did last week I do the, um, cause that's what we're using translation specifically. So from finding out about a book and getting it translated, that time's added right. in there. But, um, but even like, you know, I just finished all the stuff for consortium for our August, 2017 books. So, um, the, uh, last week they do the, where they are starting their own publishing house and coming up with how much they are going to, how much it's going to cost, like how much they're going to pay themselves in salaries and where they're going to rent a space and how much they pay the authors and marketing stuff. And then they end up losing, they lost $400,000 in the first year, um, last week. So <laughs> it's good. It's solid. thousand dollar a year salaries for, Editorial assistants are probably <laughs> yeah. Well, their their brand new press that was going to publish ten books a year had five employees getting paid fifty thousand dollars a piece for ten books. Yep, you and I could do ten books in our spare time. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I limited them. I limit them in certain ways so that they they intentionally get off get all get it all wrong and then have to figure out how to how to make it balance. Like there's right. no it's 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 rigged so that they can't break even. Um, and then we have to talk about like how you succeed after that, acknowledging that fact and like how grants work and then how backlist works and stuff like that. But I don't know, it'll be fine. Teaching is, teaching is oh. fun, but I have to, have to do a lot of dumb things today. So. All right. 
But anyways, cool. Well, I'll, we'll talk again soon. This 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 hopefully was error free. Uh, hopefully, probably not. I'm sure I mispronounced something. <laughs> Opinionated yet oh, the error free. <laughs> okay, cool, right. man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye.